let us open it up, open the floor up to reactions, questions, comments, thoughts, et cetera. Amr has a microphone there. Um, I don't know if the Twitter stream is worth invoking, but we're all in a room too, so we can speak. Jeffrey Jarvis. Laurent, I'm fascinated by, by, the, by the notion of the two-way effect of architecture and um, our notions, our definitions of pub publicity and privacy. You know, that, that the, and, and I've learned recently how the impact of the invention of the hallway in the 18th century English home, or 17th century English home, and the impact it had on the creation of a notion of privacy. Um, so in present architecture, not only of physical spaces, but also of the web, I'm trying to turn that back around and say, how is that changing? We start by trying to impose our given present definitions of privacy and publicity onto these new systems. I'm wondering the other way around, how you think these new systems are having an impact on our definitions of privacy and publicity. Make sense? Yes, it, it, it makes sense. Uh, actually, the, the example of the 19th century, what was at stake is that these borders could be done quite easily only through architecture for the main time, through space and architecture. Actually, as you said, a hallway or a, a vestibule or these different spaces which make the... And now, and this is really a, a big issue, how much architects have to deal uh, with this, uh, with these other elements, because I don't think that architecture is going to change so, so, so much as a physical uh, spa uh, space uh, in a house, for instance. I, I think the main rooms are going to stay as they are, but the possibility to go into a house through different devices like internet, this uh, is surely um, uh, important uh, thing. And I think this is also the talk Orth uh, was saying, where suddenly, uh, obviously with new devices, you can look uh, into the garden. Hmm. Can yeah. I pick up yeah. a, little, a little bit on this? Because I also find that sort of notion of of liminality to be a very sort of uh, a, um, powerful and generative metaphor. But I think, I mean, you, in your in your own talk, also sort of you know pointed to Van Gennep and those kinds of places from which from which to take sort of notions of liminality and, thre and, and, and thresholds. And one of the things that's really important in there is the social processes of separation and reintegration that are entwined with the spatial. Right. And I, I, as, so as you noted, it's not simply a spatial notion; it's a social notion as well. One of the things that, and I'm sort of struck by, you know, or inspired by, by the by the question as well, is you know, thinking about the notion of privacy at work in the in the 19th century English home is, you know, not everyone has privacy in the 19th century <laughs> English home, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. I think we're yeah agreed. I mean, you know, it's very different below stairs than it is than than it is above stairs, and that's the whole point. Um, and I, but I think that's really important for us to continue to bear in mind as we talk about these things is that there's are not purely technological arrangements, but also the social arrangements that it takes to give meaning to the to the t to the technological. Um, and so I worry a little about the about the sort of the, the rhetoric and language we use. I was thinking in in. in, in John, when you were talking about the, the use even just of the word blurring, that sort of suggests almost as if a private domain and a public domain are pre-given, and that somehow we're dealing in a world, a technological environment, which is blurring a boundary between domains that exist. And I'm not sure that actually is the, is the case here. We're all, there's always a flux um, in which processes of separation and reintegration take place. This is the sort of Van Gennep argument for um, when, that we t when we carry it over, is that it's about processes of separation and, and reintegration. I think actually the other example you gave was really, is really useful, right, which is, say, all the sort of Fourth Amendment debates, because the idea of like, oh dear, we're living, we haven't figured out what the, what the right balance is in cyberspace, suggests that we, there's any other domain in which we have figured out what the right balance is. <laughs> Again, I'm not terribly sure that we're, we're, that, that we're good at that, because you know, we're always in this process, and, and, and the, the evolution of, the, of, of space is, a perfectly, is an excellent yeah. example from an architectural um, uh, from the architectural domain, we're always in the process of reformulating what, for us, for different usses, at any given moment, is, the, is, a, is a balance that, yes. that works. Now that process of reformulation, I wonder if it feels like it's happening that much more rapidly now, in the sense of coming from the zone of actual physical architecture. There may be differing ideas of architecture as time goes on, architects think about things differently, but you build a space in large part 
you can reconfigure it a little internally, but the space you build is the space that sits there for 20, 30, 100 years. Austin Hall, not a bad example. And people come to familiarize themselves with and then be shaped by whatever the space might encourage or discourage uh, in their behaviors. When we now make the analogy to the online space, and I think already we found uh, how rich the analogies are between the two, one artifact of the online space, being online and all, is its plasticity, that it can be reshaped, reconfigured all the time, that the space is a service, it's not a product, which makes it hard to even talk about it totally as a space. And when the English house is built for English people to live in, we kind of know who the customer is, <laughs> when an online space is shaped for us to use, especially one for free, we're kind of the customer, but what's that famous aphorism now? If what you're getting online is for free, you're not the customer, you're the product. You're the one being sold. And if you're operating in a space like that that can be reshaped at any time, the Facebook I have today is not the Facebook I had yesterday because now there's auto something or other that I'm supposed to go change my settings, but I'm already bored, so I'm just going to leave them the way they are. I don't know how much those constant reconfigurations of spaces for motives, it's almost like the builder of my house continues to get a vote. I made one choice about who would build my house 20 years ago, and that builder is still hanging around. Oh, you lost your windows. Like, sorry, it's an improvement. Trust me. Live with it for two weeks. It's like, I paid you. Go away. You know? And yet, they're still here. I don't know how much that constant reconfiguration plays into things. Well, again, I suggest the recon constant reconfiguration is a socio-technical phenomenon, not a, f not a technical phenomenon. And it's rather like, you know, that the whole, you know, you can't step into the same, the same stream twice. The same way, the reason Facebook today is not the same as Facebook yesterday is not purely because of what Heraclitus Facebook did. Heraclitus foresaw Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Heraclitus 2.0. What the reason Facebook today is not the same as Facebook yesterday is not purely because of what Facebook did, but also because of what everybody else and all your friends did on right. Facebook that sh that shapes the genre of what you know. It you was intended today. for college right. students to know each other, right. but then we take it to foment revolution. That right. kind of. Thing. And I th and I think John's example of the interoperable status update really nicely points to the sort of problems of the ways in which what I say on Twitter is different from what I say on Facebook is different from what I say on Foursquare is different. Or at least it was things. until may, we interoperably put them all together. Yeah, well, so, but, 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 you yeah. know, the, those, I, as I deal with different audiences, different constituencies, and different publics, um, um, the, the, I have certain kinds of investments in yes. both the, the separations and the integrations of what is, go, of what is going on. So that, that, that reconfiguration is a socio-technical phenomenon yes. in which the technology does change, the opportunities change, yes. but our interpretations and our understandings of what genre forms are being enacted yes. here are also up for... Um, up, up for negotiation. Yes. Speaking of socio-technical phenomenon, we have these vestigial norms at the front that we shouldn't be online while we're actually on the panel, although John is pushing Thank that you. envelope. Um, <laughs> while the rest of us are happily clacking away, which means there's a great level of interest in the room being siphoned into cyberspace for which we need to build a pipe to pipe it back into the physical room. So I want to invite people not only to raise their hands if they have comments, which I actually saw two hands up, so we'll get to you guys, but also feel free to raise your hand and represent for something you saw online, which gives you the out to say, this isn't my view, but this seemed interesting to me. Here's something I want to put on the table. So I want to invite you to do that dynamically as a way of trying to reconnect what I suspect is a very active virtual space um, back to the physical one. Over here, Nell Breyer. Hi, thank you very much, Jonathan. Is this on? Yeah. Ed's there dialing up. Um, uh, Laurent, I was going to ask you if you could just speak very directly to what you feel the purpose of a threshold is. And um, a little bit to Julia's comments yesterday, she's talking about the idea of crawling and this notion in, in the art world of like crawling from gallery to gallery and what the possibilities uh, and if there are any analogies uh, absent or present in, um, in cyberspace uh, where a threshold is or is not providing the same kind of function. Understand? No. Okay. Purpose of the threshold. The purpose of the threshold. Yeah. I, I I try to to show it that it 
it's a, a exactly this this double this double meaning of of connection and of of of, of separation, which can be dealt in uh, in, in many different uh, manner. And what I try to show through this little talk that this unity of space, as it perhaps was perhaps was in the English house, I'm not sure uh, about uh, about this, has been uh, diluted in a, in a series of of different spaces, be there physical spaces or these are uh, uh, virtual spaces which in interconnect in, in, in some way. Um, I still think, uh, I'm quite convinced that the, um, there is no destruction of the traditional architectural space, but it has been overloaded or, or newly interpreted through its uh, behavior. Was there more you wanted to come back with now? Well, I was just interested in how, how, that, how that translates or what's missing when you have direct immediate arrival at locations online and there is a lack or, or a different type of experience of a threshold. Like you go- uh, Actually, actually the, I think the danger is a highly sp sp specialization of the threshold. As when you can come into a space where you can do only uh, one uh, thing, I think there there's a huge loss of independence and there it becomes in some way- But if now's over analogy is we kind of apparate like Harry Potter from one yeah. site to another online, a site is loading, it's taking too long, so it's like dub 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 dot some other site dot com. And it's like, okay, that, you know, we'll take that away, and here's this. And it just appears. Are, are you asking kind of, could one imagine a form of transition that respects the idea of a threshold? And that there's important things that the threshold provides, not just spatial, but communal and uh, intellectual and right. financial. in not just a spatial sense, but in a... Uh, how, could a yeah. how could a website be more like the Science Center, sort of luring people <laughs> in gently? From where you were into yeah. where you are. And where that, that transitional uh, experience actually then creates a very neutral zone, which is informed by the identities of the people in it, not by the context of the space that you are suddenly arrive in. So there's really an important idea of lingering from the past becoming into the present, then meeting with someone else who has a different past and in the present. So that the, the, the that's where I feel like the, the, the notion of the threshold has incredible power, political power as well. And, and if that's missing, that's why I went back to Julia's comment about crawling. If there's some lack of memory in our accessing point to point locations online, how does that change identity, public crowd, all those things that you're talking about? I, I was going to say, in some ways, this might be a question yes. for Paul, <laughs> yes, yes, because uh, maybe to make it even more concrete, could you imagine a website where when you're on the website, there's some visual representation of where other people contemporaneously visiting the website, which you normally don't know about, right? It's like being in a movie theater with a wall around you while you watch the movie. Other people visiting, you get to see where they're coming in from. Wow, there's a bunch of people pouring in from AOL to this site I'm visiting. It must not be a cool site. I'm out of here kind of thing. You know, that's, that, that's... Well, I mean, it's certainly interesting in ter I, I mean, I'm thinking actually, you know, as a, a webmasters already have access to all this information. Correct, right? you know and exactly they could where choose people come, to... Where, you know exactly right. where people come from. Right. This is information that's, so this information that's available to, available to some, if not to all. I mean, I think that, you know, I think we have to be very careful about the, the importation of, of spatial metaphors, powerful as they are, because we, you know, we can't escape space or time, um, and so those, those things um, are, are powerful for us. But it's been a very long time since anybody browsed the web with only one window or only one tab, right? So I'm not just in one place, I'm in many different places simultane simultaneously. Um, but I do think there's a, there's a, um, a question about the, um, appropriately historicizing what it is that, that that's going on, that's going on, both where the website came from itself and where yeah. and, and and where people came from. Um, that uh, let's see, not getting very far, not getting very far with this. But I, let's see. The one thing I did want to did want to add, though, is we have to recognize too that one of the power of these things is their dehistoricizing, <laughs> uh, right. you know, ability. Right. That that's actually often one of the right. things that we're about. When right. we're when we're when we're uh, uh, um, right. working working online, and I do worry about this idea that um, 
that we want to eliminate the opportunities for a creative reconfiguration of space right. by reintroducing too many of the, the things that we can do. The be both liberating and, of right. course, confining. Yeah. And it's funny, when you talk about tabs as being multiple spaces at once, in at least my experience, it's like, no, it's a bunch of stuff that I only get to visit one thing at a time. And I sometimes I'm like, if only I could configure my screen so that I could see multiple websites at once, like arranging windows in, and I'm like, wait a minute, that was the point of Windows 3.1. Remember there was like an arrange thing under window you do, a, has anybody ever used arrange? Right, what is with that? It's like meant to be a fundamental function and yet we never actually go, I think because each is too small. You just buy more small. monitors, Jonathan. You've What's got that? five monitors. Yeah, I know, I do, I buy more monitors. That, that, I finally solved my arrange problem, you're right, with more monitors. So I can't wait for the laptop of the future, which is like, plump, 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 and then you're really in the zone. It's like an iPad. David Weinberger. So I, I want to ask a, an obvious question. Um, on the grounds that you can't even step into the same stream once. So <laughs> local... That's not an obvious question, David. <laughs> well, <laughs> that is a cryptic is. question. No, it's not a question. It's an intro to the question. Well, which will be okay. You start so, with a cryptic thing, um, then an obvious real question. Real architecture is always local, right? I'm, I'm in a completely li literal sense. And so it's entirely possible and reasonable to use a threshold or an ambiguous ambivalent state uh, uh, place wrong. And we see that happen. Um, the web obviously is global. Um, privacy, uh, as Judith was, was saying, uh, you know, connecting, um, the norms of privacy are, um, have been intensely local and definitive of cultures. So is there any hope for actual privacy norms to settle down in the spaces that are put up on the global public web? Start with the lawyer. I was going to say, start with anyone else here. There are brilliant people in the. Fair enough. Does that mean we need to re-ask David's question because people are only sort of paying attention to it knowing somebody else would answer it? <laughs> David hit us one more time, and now everybody realizes they might be called upon to answer. Given the global nature of the web, is there any possibility that, and given the intense local nature of privacy norms traditionally, definitive of local cultures, of culture, is there any hope that we will come to um, global uh, privacy norms that can be counted, relied upon within um, spaces on the web which are inherently global? Thoughts on that question? Oh, right Ken there. Carson. Ken Carson. One. It's working, yeah. One thing to think about in trying to answer that is a question I was going to ask is, um, that was touched on before, is thinking about how uh, privacy and private and public spaces are related to the function of creating communities. And I think that uh, most communities have historically been intensely local, but now communities are being created that aren't local at all. And I'd like people to talk about the relationship between uh, public creation of communities and private creation of communities. Hmm. I think I still consider that a committee of the whole refinement in question. So if people have thoughts on that, just use. John Taysom, a Harvard fellow. Um, I think the answer to the question that David just posed comes back a bit to the, the, the presentation from, from Laurent. Um, and I didn't expect to be an expert on anything today, but um, on English houses, I'm definitely an expert. Um, the, the, the beginning of privateness, if you like, in the sense that Laurent was mentioning, I think was started with the chimney, the invention of the chimney. Because with the chimney, you could finally have a private space. Um, you didn't have to live in one big communal hall. Um, and from then on, the whole class distinction meant that you know, um, the servants had no privacy, and um, people who had uh, ownership had privacy. They put themselves in a room. Um, where it touches back on David's point, I think, is an architectural one. Um, if you could big, if you could build large factories, you could dominate economically. Um, and uh, where that ties back to, to being online, uh, I think, is a very pressing problem because it seems to me that the way we've architected the public spaces um, on the web mean that once again, the poorest people will have the least privacy. 
But I'm really curious to know what the panel think of that point. So this refines the question of you could see, if not global norms, a global equilibrium in which those who can afford it get some particular level of privacy respect and those who can't don't. Thoughts on that? Way over here? Um, I'm a lowly intern, but um, I think that the question... Wait, did you just introduce yourself as a lowly intern? <laughs> we all yeah. use names here unless you were trying to illustrate the difference between rich and poor. <laughs> Um, I think that the question that, to me, and like my personal experience, is more important than the creation of spaces online is the creation of spaces where people use these technologies. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East um, where internet cafes are by far the norm, and laptops and personal computers at home are extremely expensive and out of the realm of possibility for the majority of people. And I think that's a kind of publicness and privateness that is at least thus far in this discussion, a bit absent, and something about access and capital that really changes the kind of um, publicness and privateness that you're creating. And I think it's, um, there are private forums, there are ways of making your Facebook inaccessible and accessible to certain people, and there are ways in which diasporic communities are using these to recreate the local in a, um, in a globalized setting. And I think that that is worth studying, but I also think it's worth considering um, what I would do. Like when I'm at the library, I feel particularly self-conscious about using Facebook because someone might walk by and say, you're using Facebook, you should be studying. Um, well, what about if you're in Syria and everything is an internet cafe and the person behind you could be a mukhabarat, a, a spy? Um, I don't know if that's... No, a absolutely, and in fact, it probably has not escaped the notice of many regimes that want to achieve a certain level of Fourth Amendment style uh, ability to surveil, but don't want to eliminate internet access entirely and don't want to count only on filtering your private connection to do it, to see an internet cafe as a way to, it, because you can't see the secret police as long as there's one other person or maybe even zero other people in the cafe and you're using somebody else's machine, uh, you can't be assured of that privacy. And as you say, you feel it enough as a privileged person in a library, how, many, how much more must be felt? But I actually should ask you back, is your experience in those cafes that it's kind of a quiet room, clack, 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 kind of the way some of those gamer spaces are? The gamers are not there necessarily to have, you know, hang out with each other, but to be online. Or is it actually a feature? People wander by, hey, what are you looking at? That's kind of interesting, and it actually fosters connection that exists among the servants that sometimes, you know, Batman sitting across the long table from uh, his date. That was the first Batman movie? Michael Keaton? Remember that one? God, I'm getting old. But um, very big house, very wealthy, but very isolating, precisely because it's not a shared space. I don't know what your experience was in that cafe. Um, sorry. sorry. Well, I think it's different, and I've been thinking about this a lot, um, specifically with the Syria example, because I would Skype from computers, and so whether or not I had black screens around, like, um, sorry, walls, like miniature walls around the individual computer, you're still speaking out loud. Um, and I think that pe for, for people who in Syria who are trying to communicate with families, for example, outside, there's a privateness to the clack, clack, clack in what you're doing in the email you're writing, and um, then the speech act, which, inherently sort of yeah. alters the threshold. Yeah. Um, and it also definitely depends. I don't know, there was an interesting New York Times article like several weeks ago about China and uh, people who sleep in right. internet cafes. So I, right. I can only speak about right. my personal experience, but I think it, um, people do play with the spaces. Right. It actually uh, also calls to mind Nell's original point that was described as historicity, and that you could be using the computer as somebody with a nice blue passport to defend yourself, to go, I'm visiting Facebook to see if I can get there, and then the next poor person who uses the thing after you might get pegged with your historical uh, usage. You could see that uh, as a problem. There is actually, there's, a, there's an object called an iron key that we've been playing with, that you're meant to be able to walk up to any computer, plug it in, boot from this USB key, and use it totally privately, regardless of what's on that computer. 
whether or not that's privacy or just security theater is another question. Paul, you've been wanting to get yeah, a, get no, a last just, word for us. Yeah, well, I wanted to pick, pick up on this stuff, mainly because I, one of my students has been doing a lot of work on uh, with new media activists in China, and I actually started off looking at World of Warcraft players in China, and I think some of the examples that come up there really go back to the, so one of the, the, the premises of David's question, right? The web is global, but your encounters with it are always local. They're always happening in particular kinds of, particular kinds of places. For the Chinese World of Warcraft players, many of whom do go to public spaces to play alongside other people, not necessarily with other people but near other people and that's important to them one of the things that's fascinating is they're playing World of Warcraft they're playing an American game and they know it's an American game and it comes from an American company but they also talk about it importantly as a Chinese game because for them it fundamentally embod embodies the principles of Wanxi and sort of the of, of shared practice of shared commitments of sharing and, resp and mutual responsibility and they say this is a Chinese game it has Chinese values built into it so your encounter with these things was always in intensely intensely local um, and so it does go to go back to David's question you know that about what kind of expectations do we have for privacy norms well they're certainly not going to be right global agreements about what about what happens and they don't even necessarily need to be given that even in the even in this sort of global uh, uh, cyberspace your encounters with it and the actual practices always happen in particular places for particular which in people, turn in can be a feature as much as it is a yeah. bug a federated system where you can choose the communities and the norms you want to subscribe to would be the but, and way. where those global prices are opportunities for you that to give you to reimagine yourself yes. and your own position in the world. Yes. Please join me in thanking our panel for getting us off to a great start. Today.